Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode of my midweek mystery series. Where today I thought it was about time that we took a look at another Jane Doe case. It's been a couple of months since my last one and I feel so passionate about spreading the word of these unidentified people. I personally can't think of anything sadder than dying and being buried unidentified. Your name is the first thing you're given after your birth. I can't imagine leaving this world without that most basic thing. If there's anything that I can do with my platform here on the internet, it's to help reunite someone with their identity. It's just something so simple and so meaningful. Today I want to talk to you about Jane Seneca Doe, or Grundy County Jane Doe. She's known by both names across the internet, although she was buried under the name Jane Seneca Doe. Before we really get into this though, I want to give a huge shout out to The Vanished Podcast, who have an incredibly in-depth episode about this case, plus a more recent update as well. If you search for The Vanished Grundy County Jane Doe, you'll find two episodes, and it's the most recent one that you want to listen to, as that one has a more recent update tacked onto the end of it. The podcast was an invaluable resource whilst I was writing the script, because it literally features information that you can't find anywhere else on the internet. It has information straight from the mouths of people closely involved in this case. So if you want a super deep dive into this story, I can't recommend enough that you go and listen to that episode of The Vanished, but this video is going to share all of the information that you might need to help lead to an identity and or to Jane Doe's murderer. We're just trying to get as much information as possible out there into the public. This case goes all the way back to 1976, it's so almost 45 years ago now, to Ariana Township, Seneca, Grundy County in Illinois. This is a very small county with a population of only 1,781 people, as of the 1970 census. It was about 3pm on the afternoon of the 2nd of October when a farmer and his 12 year old granddaughter came across the body of a young woman in one of the many fields of Grundy County. This was harvest season and they were riding the tractor together down to a soybean field and the grandfather spotted what he thought was a deer in a ditch and went to show his granddaughter, only realising upon closer inspection that it wasn't a deer at all, it was a body. This was just off of US Route 6, only 1.4 miles east of the LaSalle County line, and the farmer rushed home to notify the authorities of what he'd found. The body was that of a black female. She was nude except for a sweater which had been wrapped around her head, and this was a red, white and black patterned knit sweater. If you're a confused Brit like me and don't quite know what a sweater equates to in British English, in the photos it looks to me to be akin to what we would call a cardigan. The farmer would say that he'd been up that same stretch of road multiple times that day and only spotted her on this last trip. He hadn't seen or heard anything suspicious that day, but he did note that his dog's been quite riled up about two nights beforehand and he hadn't been sure why. Although nowhere explicitly says it, I assume his house was fairly close to the dump site. The authorities soon arrived on the scene and found that the woman was indeed dead, although it was clear that she hadn't been there for very long. It was later noted that she'd likely been there for less than 24 hours when the farmer came across her. So it seems if the farmer's dogs had been riled up a couple of nights beforehand, it probably wasn't due to this. But of course, there's always a chance. Investigators soon discovered that the knit sweater wrapped around her head was covering something much darker. That underneath her head had been covered with a green plastic bag and bound with black electrical tape. An autopsy was performed the day after her body was found at the Range Funeral Home in nearby Joliet by a pathologist from the nearby Morris Hospital by a Dr Aluwalia. Although an autopsy would never take place in a funeral home nowadays, this was fairly standard practice in some places in the 70s. Jane Doe's cause of death was quickly found to be a single gunshot wound in the back of her head, a wound caused by a 38 caliber revolver. The bullet had entered the back of her head and had exited through the forehead. 
Her head had been covered by the bag before the gunshot wound it seemed, demonstrated by the bullet hole in the bag and a casing found inside. This seemed to be an execution. In a newspaper article from October 4th, it was noted that the body would be kept under refrigeration until an identity could be established and she could then be released to her relatives. But as we can guess, that never happened. Nobody ever came forward claiming Jane Doe. There was very little they could find in terms of forensic evidence at this scene. Bearing in mind that this case is from the 70s and forensic technology simply wasn't as advanced as it is nowadays. It was clear that Jane Doe hadn't been murdered in the spot where she was found. She had been shot somewhere else and simply dumped where she was. This spot was only one mile from the interstate, so you could simply come off the interstate and drive straight down the road, and then you'll find the spot where she was dumped. It certainly seemed like she had been killed elsewhere, and this was just a convenient place to dump her body for the killer. They also didn't think Jane Doe was from the immediate area, simply because this was a very small, quiet town of almost all white people. Locals would pay attention if she was one of the only black women in the area, and simply no one knew her face. Both NBC Chicago and Namus both know that Jane Doe had a TJ Swan bottle of wine in the pocket of her sweater, but the Vanished podcast simply states that the wine was found nearby at the scene. It was half empty, and they don't even know for sure if this was definitely related to her or not. The sweater was also found to still have a price tag attached for $15.99 and the labels inside didn't give any clue as to where the sweater was from. It simply had a cleaning label and another label with an embroidered L. I do find myself wondering if maybe L was the initial of her first name, but that was about it in terms of clues at the scene. Later dental examinations found that her teeth were in good shape and well cared for, and the post-mortem showed that she'd not been pregnant recently. Vaginal swabs also showed no sign of semen or recent sex. According to the Vanished podcast, a couple of months later, on December 18th, there was a bag found nearby which may or may not have belonged to Jane Doe. There's simply no way of knowing for sure. Inside the bag were said to be a bra, two pairs of underwear, a tattered skirt, a pair of patent leather high heels, pantyhose and two other pairs of pantyhose that had been tied together in a way that resembled handcuffs or restraints. If this bag did belong to Jane Doe, then this could be really telling. Were the tied pantyhose used in her murder to restrain her? If it didn't belong to her, then it's just a random bag of lost clothes. I do wonder if any testing was done on this bag at the time, or if it was held in evidence. I'm going to assume not, because it doesn't come up again in all of my research. The sad fact about this case is that law enforcement simply wasn't as diligent back in the 70s as they are now, when it came to both forensics and investigation. I will mention here, just because I know I will get comments about it if I don't, there's nothing I could find in my research to suggest that the reason the case wasn't well investigated was because Jane Doe was a black woman. But of course, we don't know anything for sure. That could be a reason why it wasn't looked at as much. But it does just seem that the county simply didn't have the bandwidth to fully investigate this case at the time. I don't think any other Jane Doe case would have yielded any better results. All they could do was look at the dental records and fingerprints, and when that didn't come up with an answer, there wasn't too much more they could do other than just try and spread the word about this woman. A photograph of Jane Doe was run in the Chicago Daily Bulletin, which is received by 50% of the police agencies in Illinois and some in Indiana, and her fingerprints were submitted to the FBI and other crime labs across the USA but there have never been any results to come of this. Unfortunately, there was just very little news coverage overall of this murder. As Grundy County Coroner John Callahan goes into depth about on the Vanish podcast, the 70s were just a completely different time for crime and missing people in general. People weren't as instantly connected as they are nowadays. You didn't have social media to keep track of your loved ones every move. 
Before anyone jumps down my throat, what I'm about to say is a generalisation. This is the culture of the 70s in relation with missing people specifically. But this was an era of hitchhiking and people in general moved a lot more freely than they do nowadays. Depending on the family dynamics, it could be quite normal for somebody to disappear for days or weeks at a time without letting anyone know where they're going. Which does sound like an insane concept today, I'm aware, but the level of instant communication we have today just didn't exist. If somebody did have a habit back in the 70s of disappearing off for a few days, the last time they disappear you'd wait to hear from them for a few days then a few weeks, then it's, oh, maybe they'll call next month, but they don't. You just assume the person has moved on with their life, particularly if their home life wasn't all that happy. And your first thought isn't necessarily that something terrible has happened. Maybe when they first go missing, you don't think to file a missing persons report because they'll come back. And eventually it's been years and you wonder if it's worth filing one then. Of course, all of this depends on the individual in question and the family dynamics and how close you are. But for example, nowadays, if I text my sister and she doesn't reply to me within five hours, I start to worry. Back in the 70s, it was normal not to get a phone call from somebody for a few days, a week, and then it's too late. Callahan thinks that something similar to this may have happened to our Jane Doe that a missing persons report was simply never filed for her. They certainly did scour every missing persons report from the area at the time that matched Jane Doe's description, and they found nothing. To this day, Jane Seneca Doe is the only unidentified person in Grundy County. After just 54 days on Thanksgiving, Jane Doe was buried in an unmarked grave at Bracefield Gardner Cemetery, about 17 miles from where her body was found. The burial came after the Grundy County Coroner finally made a ruling on her death. Homicide by an unknown person. The only people at the burial were the coroner at the time, James Reeves, and cemetery sexton, Joseph Tolbert, and it was noted that the case was left open after burial for further investigation. Although the sheriff at the time said that Jane Doe was about 18 years old, it was eventually estimated that she was between 15 and 23. She was a black woman with black hair and a short afro style and brown eyes. She was between 5'7 and 5'9 and 130 to 150 pounds. In terms of distinguishing marks and features, she had scars on her right hip and right lower abdomen, although it is noted the latter could be a birthmark. Her face was said to be recognisable at the time of her discovery, however the bullet did work its way through her entire head before coming out of her forehead, so I'm going to assume that this means recognisable in terms of not completely disfigured by death and not 100% perfect. Therefore, the drawings that we do have of Jane Doe are probably a pretty good representation of her, but not perfect representations. I don't know if it's just me, but the reconstructions of her face just really draw me in. She just has such a kind and gentle feeling about her. I just really want her to get her name back. The case went cold pretty quickly, but Jane Seneca Doe was never forgotten. Her case was just lying in wait until somebody had the time and the resources to revive it once again, which finally happened in 2017, 41 years after she was found. The new Grundy County Deputy Coroner, Brandon Johnson, and Coroner, John Callahan made it their mission to finally reunite Jane Doe with her name with Johnson saying to NBC5 in January 2020, I think everybody deserves closure, justice, and absolutely deserves their name. To be buried somewhere without any of that is just very sad. That could take place and you could be forgotten about for almost 44 years. When the case was first reopened, they went through the old case files and entered what information they did have into any databases they could in an effort to get a map. They hoped that modern day technology would be enough to simply give the victim a name back. But of course, it was never going to be quite as easy as that. 
Over the past few years, Johnson has given hundreds of hours to this case. He's determined to get her identified. He's examined hundreds of profiles of missing women. Sometimes their height and weights fit, but the dental records do not. Others will seem like the perfect fit, but there'll be one tiny small detail that makes it impossible. He says he's looked at the same pictures over and over again. Hundreds of missing women, families desperate to hear from them again, but none of them are Jane Doe. In December 2018, the coroner's office actually got Jane Doe's body exhumed in order to obtain her full DNA profile. They originally thought they'd have to wait until spring 2019 until the warmer spring weather, but December that year had an unseasonably warm spell so they took their chance. In the third week of December they began the exhumation. I assumed it would be an excavation team in charge of this, but according to an article on the Chicago Tribune website, it was literally the two coroners with a shovel and a backhoe. They had no idea what state Jane Doe's body was going to be in. Over four decades since she was buried, it was going to be pretty hit or miss as to whether it was in good condition or not. After about an hour and a half of digging, when they reached the coffin, which was just this metal box, they found that it was in great condition considering. They used a backhoe to lift the coffin from the ground, and when it was opened, they were shocked to find the body more well-preserved than they ever could have hoped for. They could literally still see teeth and hair. They'd come prepared to literally have to sift through the dirt for bones, but there was no need, everything was in good condition. After exhumation, the body was examined once again, and it was found that Jane Doe may have been older than originally thought. Back in the 1970s, she was thought to be between 15 and 23 years old, but a forensic odontologist had a look at the remains in 2018-2019, and it was determined that she could have been as old as 27. Thanks to a grant from NAMUS, the National Missing and Unidentified Person Systems, and the US Department of Justice, in January 2019, some of Jane Doe's bones were sent to the University of North Texas Center for Human Identification in Fort Worth. This center is globally recognized as a leader in forensic identification, and it was hoped that they might be able to provide some more answers about who Jane Doe was. By late April, it was confirmed that the lab had been able to develop a full female DNA profile and had entered it into CODIS, which is the combined DNA index system used across the country to find matches to missing people. A month after this, the coroner's office started working with the DNA Doe project in an attempt to finally reunite Jane Doe with her name. I'm sure we all know about the DNA Doe project at this point, but just in case you're new to my channel or new to the world of true crime in general, DNA Doe Project are a non-profit organisation with the sole mission of identifying does through genetic genealogy. They solved their first case in March 2018 and have solved so many since then. They're now the people to go to when trying to identify a doe, with over 60 experienced genealogists donating their time and experience to this cause. They're doing truly incredible things, and since 2019, they've been working hard on making a breakthrough in Jane Seneca Doe's case. Alongside the DNA Doe Project and NAMUS, the coroner's office have also been working alongside the Illinois State Police Lab, the Doe Network, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as well as numerous forensic artists. This case is all hands on deck. Since the case was reopened in 2017, more public awareness has been raised, meaning tips have slowly been coming in, although nothing which has been of any huge help. One woman from Mississippi said that her sister had been missing since the 1960s, but nobody reported her missing at the time. Jane Doe had a resemblance, could it be her? Sadly it wasn't. Another woman from Chicago, which is only about 75 miles from Seneca, said that Jane Doe resembled her daughter who disappeared four decades ago, and she recognised the sweater. This was a huge tip, and I think they really thought that this one could be her, but DNA sadly proved that this wasn't the case. 
somebody else contacted them saying they had a feeling that Jane Doe could have been their mother who went missing in the 70s. Testing was done and once again, not a match. They're still waiting for that one person with the answers to contact them. On the 14th of January 2020, the Grundy County Coroner's Office released a huge update in this case. The DNA Doe project, after months of effort, had successfully located a close DNA match to Jane Seneca Doe. However, it's not all easy from there due to an extensive family tree and they are requesting the public's assistance once again to finally get answers. They are so close to finding an identity here, but even if you do pinpoint a relative of an unidentified person, it can still take a lot of effort to work backwards through the family tree. The person they made the match with is a woman, a first cousin or a niece of Jane Doe's, who had purchased an Ancestry.com DNA kit and uploaded her profile to their online database. The woman currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia, but originally comes from Alabama. The woman worked closely with authorities to provide an answer as to Jane Doe's identity, but the family dynamics here are complicated and it's just not straightforward. This woman wasn't close with her extended family, it seems, and she didn't have much connection, particularly with her father's side of the family, who had died. But through this, they have been able to connect with more family members of Jane Doe's, as well as making further DNA matches with more distant cousins, but there's still no solid answer. Quite simply, complicated family dynamics and a huge family tree mean that even with a first cousin or a niece DNA hit, there are still no answers. Through talking with this woman and further family members though, they have been able to find out much more information, which is helpful in the case. These are the suggestions that DNA Doe Project have made about the identity. Jane Seneca Doe was likely born between 1948 and 1960. Her parents might have come from Selma, Alabama, whilst one set of grandparents were definitely from Selma. One of her grandparents was likely named Calhoun, whilst one great-grandparent may have been Harris. Other possible areas that her relatives reside are Dallas County or Wilcox County in Alabama, and it's thought that at least one branch of the family have moved to Ohio. She may well have siblings who are unaware of her existence. All of this to me suggests that they are so close, but there's a chance that no one on one side of a family even knew of her existence. Maybe even her own father didn't know of her existence. There's a chance that Jane Doe may have been adopted or estranged or simply not close with any members of her extended family. No one that the DNA Doe project was spoken to in this family know anything of a missing relative, nor of anyone born in the correct timeline here that could match the bill. And we're also now coming up against the barrier of ageing. If Jane Doe were alive now, she'd be in her 60s, potentially late 60s. If her parents are alive, they're probably going to be in their 80s or 90s by now. If this case isn't solved within the next decade, the chances of it getting solved ever are going to decrease dramatically. Time really is not on investigators' sides here. Johnson has said, It's sad that she could vanish without anybody missing her or knowing about her. But in this case, it makes a little bit more sense now with a large family tree and, you know, everybody's family dynamics differ. There's a good chance that a lot of her family members never knew about her. It seems to me that this is a large, fractured family. If people within the family have been keeping secrets, it can be very hard to get the answers you want, even if you do have close genetic matches. Johnson contacted the media in Selma, Alabama with information about this case in the hopes that the right people will see it. He's also sent the details to more than a dozen churches in the area, saying, Who better to reach than big congregations? An elderly person may recall someone who are missing in the community. Things are happening in this case, and I have no doubts they are going to get their answer eventually, at least as to her identity. 
Articles from January 2020 state that tips are coming in and Johnson has said that it's a very strong possibility that her last name is indeed Calhoun. But it seems that not much more has happened from there because it's now September 2021 and we have no further answers. I must say that I wouldn't be shocked though if news broke tomorrow that they finally have her name. But until then, we're still on the search for that one relative who might be able to provide some answers. If you have any family in or around Selma, Alabama, then please share this story with them. Of course, getting Jane Doe's identity will only be solving half the mystery here. She was brutally murdered. Maybe getting her identity will also provide a clear answer as to her killer, or maybe not. As nice as it would be to get justice if her killer is even still alive themselves, just giving her her name back, the most basic of things, would be so huge, it would mean so much. Anyone with any information which may lead to the identity of Jane Seneca Doe is urged to contact Deputy Chief Coroner Brandon Johnson via phone or email, both of which I will leave in the description box. I can't stress enough how close they are to an answer in this case. Even the smallest tip here could give them all the answers they need. So please share this story with anyone you know, particularly in the areas I've mentioned in this video. If you have family members with the surname Calhoun and you live in Alabama, then please find out more or tell them this story. You might be able to be the one to find the answer. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.